Hey everybody, it's Zach. Welcome to my channel where I talk about gay stuff, author stuff, trans stuff, and just random special interests that I have. Today we're going to be talking about phalloplasty options, and I want to go ahead and say up front that the majority of my research and sources were pulled from fallow.net, which is, I think, an incredibly useful source if you are looking to do a deep dive into the different types of surgeries that are available to you, then we're just going to be doing an overview. And then based on the type of interest I get from you guys, uh, I will then decide what I'm going to make next in relation to the phalloplasty options and the details and stuff like that. And just keeping in mind that this is an educational video. I'm not a medical professional. I am not offering you medical advice. I just... I want to provide you a jumping off point for your own personal research to decide what option is best for you. I want to emphasize that I'm only talking about fallow in the FTM context here. Sometimes phalloplasty has been used to correct ambiguous genitalia. It has also been used uh, to help reconstruct phallus structures for natal males who have maybe sustained an injury due to explosives or what have you to allow them to then regain the use of that appendage. But today we're going to only be talking about it in the FTM context. So today's just an overview. We're going to go over what is fallow, why would somebody get fallow, what is the history of fallow, then we're going to kind of go kind of one by one into the different types of phalloplasty that are currently available and being used. It will give you an overview and then provide you with some other sources that are not just fallow.net, where you can read up and learn about what is the procedure, what is it generally used for, and, you know, just lead you into your own research. So without further ado, let's get to the what. So what is phalloplasty? Phalloplasty is a gender-affirming surgery that creates a phallus using tissue taken from a donor site, such as the forearm, leg, back, abdomen, hip, or groin. And FTM phalloplasty may also include vaginectomy, urethroplasty, scrotoplasty, glansplasty, and implant surgery. And some of the factors that you might consider when deciding what the best option is for you is do you want erogenous sensation? Do you want to be able to do penetration? Do you want to be able to stand to urinate? Why phalloplasty? This gender-affirming surgery happens when a consenting adult exhibits symptoms of gender dysphoria that can be alleviated by surgical measures. Some doctors and insurance providers do not require gender dysphoria in order to approve surgical intervention. Some surgeons may require transmasculine individuals who are on testosterone to stop their medication for the weeks surrounding the procedure to aid in healing. This surgery and its surrounding procedures are only conducted if the risks do not outweigh the benefits. And that is something to be decided between you, your endocrinologist, your primary care physician or general practitioner, and your surgeon. What is the history of phalloplasty? In 1936, we have the first recorded total phallus reconstruction using what's called a tabularized pedicled abdominal flap surgical procedure. And in the 1980s, microvascular free flaps transfer was introduced, which means that we started doing microsurgery to aid in the healing blood supply and sensation of that area. Free flap phalloplasty is now the more common approach. So the first type of phalloplasty that I want to approach here is called Kim FTM phalloplasty. It is named after the surgeon who developed the method. So this is also called a conjoined bilateral pedicled groin flap phalloplasty. It's a three-stage procedure and it's less expensive than other microsurgeries. Um, you can, if you choose, uh, receive an implantation of a malleable erectile prosthesis but you cannot receive an inflatable prosthesis. Your results are going to look like four inches long on average by about 1.75 inches in girth. You will be able to avoid while standing as long as you choose to get your urethroplasty. 
and you may also be able to do penetration, especially if you choose an implant. Now, uh, erogenous sensation is achieved through a buried clitoris at the neophallus base. However, some surgeons may allow you to opt to leave your clitoris unburied, um, and then you will expect tactile sensation in the bottom half. The stages of the surgery are, you know, they'll vary between surgeons, as will pretty much the stages of every surgery that we talk about. But generally, stage one will be your phalloplasty, scrotoplasty, and your testicular implants. Stage two will be your penile prosthesis implantation if you choose that. And then stage three will be your vaginectomy and urethroplasty if you choose those. Now, there has been a recent bigenital surgery increase, if you will, where a lot of people are choosing to not do that stage three with the vaginectomy and urethroplasty. As I mentioned, this is actually one of the least expensive phalloplasty options. Generally, including all of the stages, averages out to be about 23,000 US dollars, which is really acceptable <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. If you're only opting to do stage one and two, that's gonna knock down your price by almost seven grand. So if you're looking for something that is affordable and flexible in terms of your options with vaginectomy and urethroplasty, this might actually be your best bet. The surgeons offering this phalloplasty are, are few and far between. You've got Dr. Kim, who's in Seoul, Korea, and then you've got Dr. Ivan Arinquez, who is in Mexico. All right, so the next option I want to talk about is abdominal phalloplasty. This is also known as suprapubic phalloplasty. It has a shorter operative and recovery time than most other surgeries, especially because microsurgery is not required, um, and you can have a buried or preserved clitoris. So uh, one of the huge positives to this surgery is that you will avoid the forearm scar, the dreaded scar that a lot of transmasculine people are not really interested in having. Um, Additionally, you should be able to do penetration, and there's generally no nerve connection required unless you choose to do urethroplasty, in which case there's a nerve connection that's used to help indicate to your body when to void and when to not. <laughs> um, and it's only got two stages. Stage one is your phalloplasty, which is done via abdominal pedicle. Stage two is your glansplasty, and that may take place during stage one, depending on your surgeon, but in most cases it can be done as early as one week after your phalloplasty surgery. Um, and then the costs range pretty widely, anywhere between 30 and 50,000 USD, and that's going to be the average cost for pretty much any other surgery that we talk about in this video. And there are a plethora of surgeons offering abdominal fallow. Um, a lot of them are in Texas and Pennsylvania, interestingly enough. For those of you who are looking into this particular surgery option, I highly recommend checking out these studies as well as just hitting up Google Scholar and typing in the surgical procedure you're interested in learning more about. Look for results. Look for what the procedure entails, look for pros and cons, and look for newer stuff. And, you know, as much as the academic community kind of is dismayed by older studies, it, they're still worth looking at. Obviously, you're going to come across some terminology that isn't as culturally sensitive as modern times. So you might come across the word transsexual. You might come across the word uh, biological female, so on and so forth. Take it with a grain of salt. Look at the statistics. And obviously, as with any study, research who wrote it, who participated, because that will give you a lot of value in terms of how much salt you should be taking with that study. The next option is birdwing abdominal phalloplasty. It's kind of a subset of the abdominal phalloplasty that we just talked about. It gets its name from the way in which the abdomen is 
cut to create the neophallus. Interestingly enough, the way that it's cut does minimize visible scarring. It makes it a lot easier to hide when there is scarring. Um, it also provides potential for implants and urethroplasty, and there's an easier post-op recovery, again, due to the shape in which the pedicles are cut. The results are an unremarkable linear scar on the abdomen, space for an implant. You're going to look at three to five inches in length. There is some tactile sensation. Surgery costs are pretty much the same as the others, and your surgeons that offer birdwing fallow are likely going to be anybody who offers abdominal fallow. They should be familiar with this procedure. If they're not, and that's something you're looking to do, talk to them and see if they'd be interested in reducing your cost in order to gain the experience by using you effectively as a guinea pig patient. But some surgeons will agree to that. So next we're going to be looking at ALT phalloplasty. This is your anterolateral thigh phalloplasty. This one's incredibly common because, again, it avoids that dreaded forearm scar. And this can actually be conducted in a few different ways. You've got the free flap or the pedicled flap, pedicled meaning it's still attached to its donor site. And then you can also get it with or without the combined forearm procedure, which we'll go into in a moment. Microsurgery is not required if you're going to do the pedicled flap, and it is compatible with urethroplasty and implants. Your results uh, should allow you to stand to void, reasonable ability to penetrate. You should be able to receive sensation. Um, and then there are severe complications possible. Of all of the information that I read about this, the complications for this particular one seem to be more likely than in others, but they're rare. And then your surgery stages over the course of two to three years will be your pre-op, which is your electrolysis, your hair removal. Then you've got stage one, which is your vaginectomy, phalloplasty, and scrotoplasty. Again, talk with your surgeon if you don't want to do vaginectomy or scrotoplasty. Those are things that you might be able to even like reduce the price of the surgery because you don't want to do them. Um, stage two, urethroplasty, which might be done in stage one or two, or both in two different stages. And then your glansplasty, which again can be done as early as one week after stage one. Then your stage three, which is your testicular implants, which might also be done in stage two. Again, talk to your surgeon, because if you don't want to get the scrotoplasty and you don't want to get the testicular implants, then that might be a more favorable option for you. There are a ridiculous amount of surgeons that offer ALT fallow, like it's one of the most common options. For those of you who are looking into this particular surgery option, I highly recommend checking out these studies as well as just hitting up Google Scholar and typing in the surgical procedure you're interested in learning more about. Look for results, look for what the procedure entails, look for pros and cons, and look for newer stuff. And, you know, as much as the academic community kind of is dismayed by older studies, it, they're still worth looking at. Obviously, you're going to come across some terminology that isn't as culturally sensitive as modern times. So you might come across the word transsexual. You might come across the word uh, biological female, so on and so forth. Take it with a grain of salt. Look at the statistics. And obviously, as with any study, research who wrote it, who participated, because that will give you a lot of value in terms of how much salt you should be taking with that study. So our next topic is RFF phalloplasty. This is radial forearm fa flap phalloplasty. Say that 10 times fast. I know I tried and failed. Um, it is actually the most common. It is compatible with both urethroplasty and prosthesis. The results are that you will have visible scarring on your forearm and potentially some loss of sensation, some difficulty in using your hand. You should be able to penetrate provided you use prosthesis. You should be able to stand avoid provided you choose to do urethroplasty. And you should be able to receive erogenous sensation 
via a buried clitoris at the base of the shaft. Your surgery stages for this typically follow the ATL surgery stages, and the costs are comparable. And there are a significant number of surgeons who offer this, uh, pretty much equivalent to the number of surgeons who offer ATL. If you're looking to do some research on what this is, what it looks like, pros and cons, these are some of the studies that I recommend reading. Um, again, it's really important to kind of ignore the title in these. If you feel the words don't apply to you, that's fine. Focus on the anatomy, focus on what it is that you want to achieve, what risks you're willing to accept, and focus on listening to the reports from people who have gone through these surgeries. The next one I want to talk about is MLD phalloplasty, and it has actually two different options. We're going to go over the broad strokes one first and then the more specific aspects of the newer option that's been developed. So MLD phalloplasty is a surgery that uses tissue from the back muscle to create a good-sized phallus that enables standing to void as well as erectile function with a phallus implant. The musculotaneus latissimus dorsi, MLD, flap comes from a part of the back muscle that includes the thoracodorsal vessels and nerve. The blood supply is connected to the femoral artery and the saphenous vein or the deep inferior epigastric artery and vein. The thoracodorsal nerve is connected to the ilioinguinal nerve. That's a freaking word. Um, and because that thoracodorsal nerve is a motor nerve and not a sensory nerve, sensation in the phallus is not expected with this procedure. That's important to note. No nerve connection is done to the dorsal clitoral nerve even so, some patients do report tactile sensation in the phallus. So what are the top three things to consider here? It is compatible with urethroplasty and scrotoplasty. In terms of size, you can expect 5 to 6 inches in length, 3.9 to 4.7 in girth, and you do have erogenous preservation because the clitoris is left untouched. And many phases... Um, are involved here, and it can actually require debulking procedures. If you look back up at girth, I think that kind of speaks for itself there. So a rendition on the MLD phalloplasty is the reinnervated latissimus dorsi free flap phalloplasty. And reinnervated is the key term here. It is prosthesis free and provides penetrative ability. So Let's get into it. In a 2008 study led by Dr. Rano at Masuric University, the reinnervated latissimus dorsi free flap phalloplasty was used in phalloplasty surgeries to allow voluntary rigidity of the neophallus. From the first 22 patients, 18 obtained motoric function of the reconstructed phallus, and researchers concluded that this voluntary contraction of the phallus is a consequence of the reinnervation of the transferred muscle and the contraction is strong enough to stiffen the phallus. In this procedure, the thoracodorsal nerve is structured to the anterior branch of the orbiturator nerve, which runs to the gracilis muscle. All of that to say, yes, it's possible to achieve um, voluntary rigidity of the neophallus using this method. I don't know what the longevity looks like because of how new this is. Um, and then there's some studies that you can look into in terms of learning kind of what this is, how does it work. Number one is going to be the original study. Number two is talking about the technique. And number three is an evaluation of the results in terms of contraction power and voluntary rigidity. There are several surgeons that offer MLD, not nearly as many, though, as would offer ATL or RFF. MLD is a really specialty type procedure because it involves using a muscle from your back. Um, so these are currently the only surgeons who offer it. There are some in the United States, obviously some in uh, the Czech Republic. All right, so we're on to our last phalloplasty procedure. And that is going to be fibula free flap phalloplasty, FFF. <laughs> and this one is really fascinating. This one has some potential issues with longevity 
of the results, but let's kind of get into what this is first. The benefits of this surgery is that you're going to have no forearm scar, you're going to have natural rigidity without an implant due to the use of your fibula bone, you're going to have a barrier to preserved clitoris, and you may be compatible um, with urethroplasty depending on your surgeon and your end results. You can expect tactile sensation, you can expect the ability to penetrate, you can expect a length of 1.5 to 6 inches, however there are risks. The two like really big risks here, number one, the fibula bone that is used to create rigidity in the neophallus may actually end up being reabsorbed by your body. That's one thing. And number two, your risks related to your donor area recovery and post-operative use of your leg, your ankle, in terms of walking, running, balance, stability, there's a lot of risk there. They take a significant chunk of your fibula, which means that of the two bones that hang out in the bottom half of your leg, one of them is mostly gone. You've got two surgery stages here. You've got your phalloplasty as stage one, and stage two is your debulking and glansplasty. And the surgeons who offer fibula free flap are going to be few and far between. <laughs> there is one in Texas, and the rest are going to be outside of the United States. Strongly encourage whoever wants to undergo this procedure to read up on as much literature as possible. On the screen are a few of the studies that I think are worth reading. Some of them are recent, more of them are older. As you can see, this is not an incredibly popular procedure. However, I can understand the appeal. All right, guys, so that is my brief overview on the different options available to those who are seeking phalloplasty. We talked about the different types of phalloplasty that are available, what surgeons offer them, the pros and cons of each, obviously not all inclusive here, just touching on the very briefest of highlights. And then we also discussed the actual procedures themselves, the procedure details, I want to say thank you so much for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit subscribe. Put a comment down below on which one of these procedures you'd like to learn more about in terms of pros and cons. Maybe I get an interview with a surgeon or somebody who's undergone a procedure on my channel. I think that would be really awesome, but obviously I want to know what you're interested in. And uh, yeah, so like, subscribe, comment, share, and have a great day. Good luck with your choices. Talk to a doctor. <laughs> Bye.